Okay, so as Paul said, the, the, the title uh, I'm going to be talking about is the deterioration of concrete due to the oxidation of pyrotite, and specifically my uh, experience doing petrographic work on the foundations uh, in Connecticut. Next slide. So these, of course, are all uh, poured concrete foundations as opposed to the blocks in, in Ireland. Uh, just a couple of photographs showing very severe distress. We typically see this pattern cracking or this uh, uh, horizontal cracking distress indica indicative of the expansion of the concrete. Uh, next slide. Uh, just another picture of the interior basement wall showing that horizontal uh, cracking distress. Next slide. And another one on the interior. And in some cases, we're getting enough expansion that these walls are actually bowing and causing issues with the house above. Uh, next slide. So I first became involved um, with working uh, on, for an insurance company in 2008 on a petrographic examination of uh, cores from one of the foundations and um, was involved in a, uh, was an expert witness in the first lawsuit that went to trial where a homeowner uh, sued their insurance company. Um, I've done work for a, a number of different, uh, eight uh, different types of companies and homeowners and uh, home buyers out there. Uh, to date, I've done uh, petrographic examinations on over 625 cores from the Connecticut and Massachusetts foundations, although the vast majority of these have, have come from Connecticut. Uh, so far, all of the cores that I've looked at that have reactive aggregate have been tied to this one particular uh, quarry in Connecticut. Um, although I'm cur currently uh, trying to determine uh, if there are maybe a couple other uh, quarries in Massachusetts that may have supplied reactive aggregate. So we're trying to trying to figure that out right now. Um, eventually became involved with assisting the homeowners advo advocacy group led by Debbie McCoy. I've been working with Debbie for a number of years. Next slide. So I want to give just a quick review of, of how you do a petrographic examination. The ASTM standard is ASTM 856. Uh, next slide. So once the cores are, are removed from the, uh, the foundation walls, sent to our laboratory. Next slide. Uh, the, the cores are sectioned from one end to the other with a concrete saw. Uh, next slide. And this just shows the, the, what the saw cut section looks like. Um, and then what we do is we go through a procedure of, of lapping or polishing the surface. And then on the right-hand side, it shows what, what it looks like after that preparation of the sample. Next slide. So the, the sections are then examined under a, a, a stereo microscope at magnifications up to about 100x. Um, uh, like I said, first on, on, a, on a stereo microscope. And then uh, the next slide. We can also make concrete thin sections uh, where the a portion of the concrete is uh, epoxy to a glass slide and, and cut and ground down to a thickness of anywhere from 20 to 30 microns, depending on uh, what we're, we're looking at. Uh, and that's thin enough so light can pass through the sample. Next slide. And the thin sections are examined on a, uh, under a petrographic microscope. Uh, petrographic microscopes are used by geologists to determine the, uh, uh, or to identify, well, yeah, determine the rock types, identifying uh, the minerals present by identifying the minerals present, sorry, uh, in the rock by using the optical properties of the of the minerals. Um, so we, uh, concrete petrographers also use a petrographic microscope to look at the uh, uh, the cement paste uh, at higher magnifications. A petrographic microscope typically is uh, goes up to about 500x. Uh, next slide. Um, as Dr. Lehman uh, showed, we also use uh, scanning electron microscopes. These microscopes go into many thousands uh, magnification, and any region that we want to look at, uh, we can actually, uh, if, if you have an EDX detector attached to the, uh, to the microscope, we can determine the elemental composition of any area of the sample that we're looking at. Uh, next slide. So the, the aggregate from the, uh, from the kinetic quarry, it's a, it's a pretty complex metamorphic rock ranging uh, between a granitic gneiss and a schist. Uh, the main minerals are, are quartz, feldspar, and biotite mica. Typically contains significant amounts of garnet and often contains selenite, selenite and graphite, occasionally uh, pyroxene minerals. Um, and of course, uh, small amounts of iron sulfide minerals, uh, primarily pyrotite, um, but also pyrite, small amount, or trace of minor amounts of pyrite, calcopyrite, and pentlandite. Uh, we have seen individual uh, 
particles, aggregate particles that have very high amounts of pyrotite, uh, sometimes as much as 25 and even as high as 75%. Next slide. So the quarry was supplying both a, uh, a crushed stone and a uh, gravel aggregate that were, were, were both reactive. Uh, the crushed stone it has a, a the reactive rock particles, but there are other rock types in the in the concrete. This just shows a, a, some lap sections of the crushed stone. Uh, next slide. So you can see from the from the quarry, the, it's 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 a pretty complex geology with uh, multiple rock types and faults. Next slide. Again, just another another, another picture of the of the quarry. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a, a, a photograph showing the. Uh, lap sections of two cores that have the gravel. It's a, it's a crushed gravel, and the gravels that even have more uh, variety of rock types uh, relative to the crushed stone. Next slide. Um, so, as I talked about, there's there are multiple rock types in this aggregate. The X, the yellow Xs, are marking the reactive aggregate particles. We, when we do analysis, we typically see that the the concretes contained anywhere from generally 25% up to 45% uh, reactive aggregate particles. Um, this crack shows, I mean, this, uh, this picture shows the cracks highlighted with black ink, so you can see where the, where the cracks are typically expanding from those reactive aggregate particles. Um, next slide. So some of the other rock types we see in this aggregate are amphibolites, quartzite, granite, diorite, diuretic gneiss, and diabase. But there are a, a relatively, uh, uh, high amount of pyrotite bearing non-reactive aggregate particles that are granitic nice. And these rock particles have much tighter structure, uh, more dense than the reactive rock particles and are really are not allowing any moisture into the rock particles. So they're, they're, even though they have pyrotite in them, they're not reacting. And I've seen some of these rock particles in concrete, these concrete foundations uh, that are over 30 years old and there's, there's just no reactivity going on on this. Next slide. Uh, interestingly, we've, we've, we've seen that over time when these houses were first being constructed in, their, in the early 80s all the way through to the 2000s, um, we're seeing a decrease in the amount of reactive rock. So the, the, the percentage of reactive rock particles has decreased over time. So as they're running, going through the quarry, they're actually getting to a little better quality rock where they're getting more non-reactive rock particles and, and less reactive rock particles. Next slide. So the distress mechanisms uh, have been talked about um, from Dr. Lehman and, and uh, Benoit Fournier, uh, but you know the most important thing here is <clears throat> is the exposure to moisture. Um, you know these foundations either had no moisture barrier on the exterior surface or a poor quality uh, material that was letting water through. Um, so the water is coming through the concrete. Um, it's it's getting into these reactive aggregate particles and causing oxidation of the, of the pyrotite. Um, the pyrotite, uh, as it oxidates, ox, uh, as it oxidizes, produces uh, iron oxides and iron hydroxides, which cause an expansion. Uh, that expansion causes cracking in the aggregate particle as, as it gets exposed to more water. Uh, you have more oxidation, more expansion. Eventually those cracks are moving into, into the cement paste and, and throughout the concrete. And what happens is as these, as these cracks are occurring in, in the aggregate particles, it's opening up more pathways for further exposure of, of the pyrotite minerals in the interior portion of the particle. So over time, you actually get an acceleration uh, of the amount of distress that's occurring in these foundations. Um, and, and it's also, these cracks are also allowing easier access of water to move through the concrete. Um, so, you know, a lot of times in the uh, in these foundations, uh, they may not have seen really any significant pattern type cracking distress until 10 years, sometimes as much as 15 years. But then by 18 years, you're getting very severe cracking, in some cases, uh, cracks that you can stick your, your finger into. So it, it really is an, uh, an accelerated process over time. And of course, as the others have talked about, um, you, you know, when you're getting oxidation of these iron sulfide minerals, you're releasing sulfur and you have the sulfate attack, which has already been discussed, and you get formation of etringite, thomasite, in severe cases, gypsum, and those uh, reactions act to cause expansion of the cement paste and a softening of the cement paste. So you've got, you know, multiple things going on. You've got the expansion of the aggregate from the from the oxidation of the pyrotite, and you've got a expansion of the cement paste and a, and a softening of the cement paste from the sulfate attack. Next slide. 
Okay, so I'm just going to run through these uh, pictures pretty quickly. It's just one, one thing: the the, um, the individual rock particles particles that are reactive, um, they just vary widely with regard to texture, mineral composition, and degree of metamorphism. Um, and as we move through these, um, all these particles I'll show you here initially are, are reactive rock particles. You can just see the difference in how they uh, they appear from from slide to slide. Okay, next slide. Okay, the red arrows there are showing the uh, the, the pyrotite in the uh, in one of these reactive rock particles. Um, one thing I, I, I think I, I I can't call if I mentioned on the um, the previous slide when we were talking about the the amount of uh, uh, wanted to say about the amount of the pyrotite. Typically, we see about three to five percent of these rock particles, uh, three to five percent pyrotite in the rock. Um, but as I said, sometimes it can be much much higher. And I'll show you some pictures of uh, of that. Next slide. Uh, just another reactive rock particle. All the, all the pink minerals are the are the garnet that's in there. Next slide. Um, just another reactive rock particle. The the, the pyrotite is is kind of the brownish colored middle and it's oxidizing. Next slide. Just another another example. Next slide. So you can see that a lot of these rock particles just just look different from from picture to picture. Next slide. Um, that's just a close-up. That uh, dark brown mineral in, in the middle, in the top of that agate particle, is, is just severely oxidized pyrotite. Next slide. I know, just another reactive rock particle with a different uh, texture. That's that's fine. Um, and and this just shows a close-up, but you can see the kind of the goldish-colored mineral on the top. It's got some the, the striations in it, indicating oxidation. I'll show you some some better examples of that. Uh, next slide. Uh, just another example, red arrows pointing to the uh, pyrotite. Next slide. Um, this is one of these particles where about 75% of the particle is, is uh, pyrotite, all that gold color. Uh, next slide. And this is a, a close up and you can see the, the pyrotite in the more the interior portion of the particle is, uh, is, is still gold, less oxidized. As you get towards that exterior, you can see all the uh, striations in the mineral. That's an indication of oxidation. In the very end, you get that kind of that darker brown color indicating a significant oxidation. Next slide. Uh, just another good example that the pyrotite on the on the right side, you can see it's 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 definitely beginning to oxidize, and the and the pyrotite on that top part is just that rusty brown color showing severe oxidation. Uh, next slide. Um, just another one with a high amount of pyrotite. Uh, the, the gray mineral is the uh, Graphite in there. Some of them have high amounts of, of graphite also. Next slide. And of course, like uh, they, they did, they the quarry is supplying uh, fine agate that also shows uh, reactive rock particles. So these are just a couple uh, fine agate particles that are that are also uh, pyrotite bearing and reactive. Next slide. So these are particles that I mentioned that are this uh, this much denser rock. All the light colored minerals you see there are the pyrotite, but due to the dense structure uh, of, of, of this rock, we're not really seeing any types of, uh, any sort of reactivity or, or oxidation of the pyrotite. Uh, next slide. Just another one of these uh, non-reactive pyrotite bearing rock particles. And the last slide, next one, shows another, another one. Okay, so the next slide. Okay, so I'm probably getting to the end of my time here, but, um, uh, there, there is an ASTM specification for performing a petrographic examination of, of aggregates in concrete, ASTM C295. Um, some of these other things uh, I was hoping to have time to talk about. We, maybe in the discussion we can talk about, but I want to get down to the uh, last item there about with regard to the Donegal and, and Mayo aggregates. Um, you know, we know the Mayo aggregate has the uh, framboidal pyrite that causes a lot of the same problems that I just talked about with the, uh, with the pure type. And um, I also received some uh, some cores from uh, Paul from the Donegal uh, Foundations. I've done some preliminary work. I haven't gotten to the uh, extent of work that uh, Dr. Lehman has. Um, it's shown some really uh, excellent results. Um, but my preliminary re results, you know, do show yeah that these these aggregate particles do contain a um, some of the particles show significant amounts of uh, pyrotite uh, and also trace amounts of uh, pyrite. Um, pentlandite and arsenopyrite, um, but you know they they don't have as met, much I think as uh, pyrotite as the the kinetic aggregate, but I think it's a, a significant amount. Um, I did see evidence of oxidation of these of these uh, pyrotite minerals, 
and um, and evidence of increased levels of, of sulfates in the cement paste indicating sulfate attack. So, uh, you know, it, it would it seems to me that yeah, there's you know there is a potential issue with um, with the pyrotite in these aggregates, um, and you know I, I definitely think that all these quarries where there's uh, that have that contain uh, pyrotite, you know, really we really need to do the research and and, and testing on the aggregates uh, to determine if they are potentially reactive in concrete uh, before, you know, before they're used in concrete. So that, uh, I think my time is about up. And like I said, hopefully we can uh, touch on some of the other things maybe during the discussion.